Now, after you've filled out the forms, now you need to file them. Filing is a three-step process. First, you fill out the plaintiff's claim, SC100, and any attachments. Second, you're going to make a copy of every page of each form, one for you and one for each and every defendant. Even if you're suing a husband and wife, they each get their own claim. And finally, you're going to turn in the copies and the originals to the small claims clerk and pay a fee. In some counties, such as San Mateo and Santa Cruz, you can actually file online at easylegalfile.org. In other counties, you can fill out the forms online and turn them in to your clerk's office. It's also important to know where to file your case. Most of you are here at this courthouse because you live close to here, but you actually need to file where the defendant lives or does business at the time of filing. This is a rule of fairness. If we're going to sue someone, it's not fair for them to travel miles and miles away from their home to defend themselves. But with every rule, there are the exceptions, and these are the most common exceptions. For example, you enter in a contract with your landlord here in San Mateo County, but your landlord lives in Alameda County. You can sue in Santa Ma San Mateo County because you signed your rental contract in San Mateo. Now, another thing people don't realize is that you don't have all the time in the world to file your claim. There is a thing called a statute of limitations, which puts a limit on the amount of time you have to bring your claim. Now, I don't want you to rely on this table for your claim, because you might not know when the statute begins, when it ends, and there's many more statutes of limitations. Just know that you should file as soon as you discover you're injured, and if you want to find out exactly what your statute of limitations is, you should talk to an attorney. Now, after you fill the forms and you file them in the correct courthouse, now you need to tell the defendant to show up in court. This is known as service a process. And this means that someone other than you, it could be a friend, a relative, or a process server. This is someone who you can find through the yellow pages, um, and they charge between $50 and $100, and they can serve your claim for you. They must be an adult. They cannot be a party to your lawsuit. And this person is going to actually give your claim to the defendant by personal service or substitute service. And finally, this friend, relative, or process server will fill out that second form we mentioned, proof of service, SC-104, which will tell us, the court, that your defendant was in fact served. Personal service is where you first identify the defendant, at home, at work, on the street, Second, tell them you're being served. Third, hand them the papers. The moment your friend, relative, or process server hands them the papers, they're considered served. Service is complete. Doesn't matter if they try to rip those papers up, they slam the door in your friend's face. As long as the papers are left in their presence, they are served. Substitute service is similar to personal service. It's where you go to the home of the defendant. They're not home. Or you go to their office and the manager's there. Can you leave with the manager? Can you leave with the husband or wife at the house? Absolutely. As long as you tell this person who the forms are for and what they are, and then your friend needs to follow up by first class postage, first class mail, postage prepaid, to the same place where the first copy was left. Ten days after mailing, service is complete. Now there's another form of service I didn't mention at the forefront. It's called certified mail. This can only be done at your clerk's office. And the reason I didn't mention it at the beginning is because, as you see at the bottom of the slide, is that it's the least successful. Only about 50% of defendants actually receive notice in this way. I only recommend you to do certified mail if you can't do personal, you can't do substitute, or if your defendant is a corporation and they have hired an agent to receive service on their behalf. But please be proactive. Contact the clerk's office to make sure that defendants sign the return receipt. Again, this is the only form of service that the defendant actually needs to sign something. The other two forms, personal and substitute, the defendant doesn't sign anything. It's your friend, relative, or process server who completes the proof of service. Now, it's important to remember that there are a lot of deadlines with small claims court. And unfortunately, no one at the clerk's office will be calling you to remind you about these deadlines. So let's start and pretend that you file your claim and it's the first of the month. The same day that you file your claim, you're going to actually get your hearing date. 
your hearing date is about 45 to 70 days later so that you have time to give notice. If you're suing someone outside of your county, you'll need to give them 20 calendar days of notice. How will you figure out this date? Well, you start with your hearing date. And you'll just count 20 days back. You're going to include the weekends because they're calendar days, not business days. But if you're suing someone within your county, you need to give them 15 calendar days of notice. Again, start with your hearing date and count 15 days back. And that second important form that we mentioned, the proof of service, which tells the court that your defendant was in fact served, that needs to be filed about five calendar days before your hearing. And finally, you'll receive the decision from the judge within 10 to 12 days by mail. Now another common question you might have is, how do I sue someone if I don't know where they live? It's very important to know where your defendant lives for the purpose of filling out the SC100, the plaintiff's claim, for the purposes of serving them, giving them notice, in the end, possibly to collect your money. As long as you know something about them in the left-hand column, there's free public resources in the right-hand column to help you find him or her. Now we're going to talk to the other party, the defendant. Now even if you're not a defendant and you're a plaintiff, it's important to know how is the other side going to respond once you sue them. Now just like you, the defendant doesn't really want to go to court. Even if they tell you, sue me in court, or I'll see you in court, they don't really want to go. So defendants, when you receive the plaintiff's claim in the mail, feel free to call the plaintiff up and try to settle it informally. And if you do reach an agreement, great. But you need to ask the plaintiff to dismiss their claim. And you can ask them to dismiss it with prejudice. This means that they can never refile their claim against you in the future. Plaintiffs, on the other hand, you probably want to ask the defendants if you can dismiss it without prejudice. This way, if they don't fulfill their promise, you can still sue them in the future. Now, defendants, if you think you weren't properly served, you didn't get proper notice, you should still go to court. Do not ignore the claim. Because if you don't, the plaintiff can go to court, and they can tell their one-side story to the judge, and they can get a decision against you called a default judgment, which will affect your credit record and your assets. Or, plaintiff, if you feel like you need more time, you can request from the court to have more time by filing a form called Request to Postpone Small Claims Hearing. It's a simple form that you'll fill out and you just need to give the plaintiff 10 days of notice. Or defendant, if you feel like the claim was filed in the wrong courthouse, this is called venue, you can also request from the judge to have it changed. You'll simply write a letter to the judge and tell them why and request to dismiss the claim. Or you can decide to go to the courthouse yourself and tell the judge that you are not making an appearance. You simply just think this is the wrong courthouse. Or you decide to just go to court and defend the claim against you. Now plaintiffs, oftentimes when you sue the defendant, you're opening up the door for them to sue you. Because they have their own claim called the defendant's claim. It's exactly the same form as your claim. In fact, their claim doesn't even have to be related to your claim, but it does have to be under the limit. Defendants, if you have a claim that is over the limit and it is related to the plaintiff's claim, you have the right to transfer your claim and the plaintiff's claim to superior court. Or you can decide to defend the plaintiff's claim against you and bring your own claim later.